Welcome, bet riders around the world. My name is Gary Solomon, and you're watching the Laid Back Bike Report. It is so nice to have you all with us today, Bent Riders. Let me tell you what we've got in store for you today. A great show. Going to kick it off, as always, with our pal Hans Agala with uh, Recumbent News. Now, our featured guest today, well, I'm wondering, have you ever thought about adding a uh, e-assist motor to your uh, Recumbent uh, trike or bike? We've got just the guy to to, to help you make the decision about what to buy and how to install and all those things. It's David Hall from EcoCycles. You're really going to like that segment, so stay tuned for that. Then uh, next we have Mark Lesourd from uh, France. Mark is the race director for the HPV World Championships, which will be there in France uh, this summer. And we're going to talk to Mark and uh, tell you all about what's coming up in the World Championships this year. And we're going to head over to uh, Denny Voorhees, sports director, and he's going to have a segment on the recently completed Bike Sebring uh, in Florida and also the big honking trike rally. He was there for some of that, and we have uh, a little report telling you about the great fun that the trikers had uh, down there in central Florida uh, last month, the big honking trike rally. And lastly, uh, a more recent event I picked up on, I'm going to tell you a little bit about an invisible road submarine. Uh, it's an article about, uh, well, let's just wait. I'll tell you about that a little bit later on. All right, let me introduce you to the folks that helped me out uh, on this show. Uh, we have uh, folks from all over the place. My crew, what would I do without them? First of all, my director today, it is Larry Seidman from Colorado Springs. Hi, Larry. Hey, Gary. And uh, down in Jackson, Mississippi, uh, my media dude, he uh, makes us all look good here. It's Trey Burgoyne. Hey, Trey. Howdy, folks. And let's see, down in central Illinois uh, today, she just sent off her Velmobile to uh, get all spruced up for riding season. It is our own Nina Paley. Hi, Nina. Hello. And uh, in Cold Spring, Kentucky, as always, it's Larry Varney from Bet Rider Online. Hi, Larry. Howdy, everybody. And there's the aforementioned Denny Voorhees. Uh, Denny Hi. is our sports director, and it's great to have you back, Denny. Hey, happy to be here and, and looking forward to the show. All right, great. Thanks, guys. All right, let's uh, move along. I'd like to uh, make sure you all understand that we have live chat going with each of our webcasts, and we would love to hear your input. You can chat with your fellow Bent Riders or comment on our guests or uh, ask questions of our guests. We'd love to, to have you do that. And please, uh, at least check in. And tell us uh, who you are and where you are watching from. We love to uh, to see that. Now, how about supporting the Laid Back Bike Report? Uh, we have great supporters all over the world. How can you support us? Well, you, you can certainly like us on Facebook. You can subscribe to us on YouTube. We're getting very close to 10,000 subscribers. And that's a, a, a remarkable uh, achievement if we can get there. So please, if you haven't already subscribed to us on, on YouTube, please do that. And if you want to find out more about Layback Bike Report, past shows, what's coming up, uh, all kinds of other details, uh, the little white eye that's going to pop up right there will take you to our website, laidbackbikereport.com. And uh, you can find out more there, including how you can become a Patreon supporter like all these folks are here. And you can do so for as little as a dollar a month. We'll talk a little bit more about that at the end of the show. We also have amazing industry sponsors uh, for the Laid Back Bike Report. Let me tell you about them. First, we have TerraCycle, makers of exquisite recumbent parts and accessories for your bent. And Trailside Trikes, a fine recumbent trike shop on the Withlacoochee Trail in Florida and now in Knoxville, Tennessee as well. And Terra Trike Greenspeed, 
the best in leisure, performance, adventure, touring, electric, and portability. Wherever your adventure leads, TerraTrike will take you there, and Greenspeed, where Ian Sims designs bring performance through science and engineering. And Laid Back Cycles, the top USA dealer for TerraTrike and the premier source for Cat Trike, Ice, and Greenspeed. We give you the freedom to ride. And Connecticut Yankee Peddler, we feature multiple brands of trikes, including electric assist models. Test rides and Southern Iowa hospitality are always available at our mega store in Cheriton. And Avenue Trikes, with the gearing you need and the comfort you want, in stock and ready to ship so that you can enjoy riding again. Dealer inquiries are welcome. And Azub, helping people from the recumbent community embark on challenging expeditions worldwide. Stories and tips can be found at azub.eu slash tour. And recumbent PDX. With 150 trike inventory, recumbent PDX is the West Coast only cat trike mega store. We have over 20 trikes on our showroom floor just waiting for you to test ride through our beautiful Portland neighborhood. Call or email to schedule your test ride today. All right, folks, uh, we do have a report from Hansa. It's a relatively short one, as I'm sure most of you know. There's a lot going around, uh, a lot going down in Eastern Europe right now. Uh, scary nature. And uh, so Hansa couldn't quite be with us today, but he was able to submit a short report that I think is going to be very relevant to what we've all been watching. So, uh, Larry, let's have a look. Hello, everybody. Honza Gala from recumbent.news here once again. I don't have any recumbent, particular recumbent news for you this time, but I have one update. You may know Alexei uh, Gansin from Ukraine. Uh, under his nickname Velo Dreamer, he has been active on uh, uh, Facebook and YouTube ever since, uh, informing about his uh, different interesting builds like uh, two-wheeler strikes, even social tandems and velomobiles. And uh, he has been working uh, on a on a racing velomobile uh, in the last months. Uh, this racing velomobile should be used uh, uh, under the North American Velomobile Racing Association, uh, founded uh, by Jason Dubin. Dubin. Uh, sorry, if I pronounced the name wrong. Uh, I am in contact with Alexei. He is uh, not in direct danger at the moment. And he's waiting how the situation will evolve in the next days. Uh, if if things go wrong, he can leave uh, Ukraine. Uh, and he has an offer uh, from Piotr, uh, the owner of uh, of the owner of uh, Pima Velobike, the Polish company producing cap bike velomobiles that he can uh, come to his place with his whole family and um, stay there and continue working on the project uh, there in Poland if it's needed. But we all hope that he will be able to stay in Ukraine and that uh, the war there will end uh, as soon as possible. So that's it uh, from me for today. Uh, enjoy the show and yeah, have a great day. Bye. Thank you, Hansa. And yeah, we, we wish Alexei and all the Ukrainians the the best and uh, for a, a solution there that uh, isn't going to take too long. So, all right, guys, we're going to move along now to our first and featured segment. Uh, I hinted at it earlier in the show. It's all about uh, putting together an e-assist motor for your existing uh, recumbent uh, biker trike. And uh, we've got just the greatest person to talk to us about that. It is the founder of EcoCycles from Nashville, Tennessee. And they, uh, they're they big into uh, setting up uh, e-assist for, uh, for bikes and, uh, and personal service for all that. Uh, I don't need to say too much more because I'm gonna let uh, David do the talking. He's gonna explain uh, all about what they do and what they have, 
And uh, right now we're going to take a look at the, the video. So, Larry? Well, we are here with David Hall from EcoCycles. David, how are you today? Pretty good. How are you doing? Doing great. Well, let's uh, find out a little more about EcoCycles and back uh, into your history, maybe to start out with. Tell us about the history of EcoCycles. All right. So, uh, you know, I've always been the type to tinker with stuff. And uh, I want to say maybe 2014, somewhere around there, um, we were playing around. Me and my father actually had took some uh, motors off electric wheelchairs and we were rigging them up on bicycles and making a friction drive where it just directly drove the wheel and just kind of playing around with that. Um, around that same time, you know, we're based in Nashville and Nashville really started booming. So it was getting crazy. The traffic was just unbearable. So uh, right around that time, maybe 2015 by then, you know, uh, Bafang was putting out their first kits. Um, there was some, uh, some ready to go hub motor conversion kits on the market. So I started making some conversion bicycles and just having fun with that. Um, and, you know, it's, you know, went from there to me making some conversions for friends and just getting more and more into it. Um, you know, as time passed by, I kind of I had some contacts in China, too. And it was you know always hard to get components and hard to get components that matched and everything would be different, different connectors, this and that. So, you know, started reaching out and uh, and just importing some supplies, you know, bulk for my own purposes, get them a little cheaper, get them, you know, made with the right connectors, things like that. Um, 2000, maybe 16, 17, something like that. I had got to the point where I was I was more well-rounded in my knowledge about it and uh, hit on torque sensing assist, which uh, which was just a world of difference compared to anything up until that time. Because previously, everything I had used either was operated by like a, a twist throttle where, you know, you just twist it and it goes or a thumb throttle or cadence sensing, which was uh, just, uh, you know, you turn the pedals and it goes. So right around that time, we found the, the Tong Sheng TSDZ2, and that was gaining popularity, um, especially in like Europe and Asia. Um, the torque sensing was just something we hadn't experienced. And it was just, it was really a pleasure. You know, it just senses how hard you push and adds the assist accordingly. And it was just, it was a, it was a different beast, you know, it was a different animal uh, and we really liked it. So the problem was the motor was made more for the Asian and the European market where they have different laws that regulate the power. And I didn't feel like it really lived up to the potential that it could, um, especially given the differences in the U.S. market and the U.S. legislation. So we worked with the manufacturer um, to make some upgrades and modifications to the motor and started importing them into the U.S. on a, on a larger scale. And right around that time, I think, is when we really crossed over from just hobbyists into saying, hey, you know, uh, there was a lot of interest. We were talking on Endless Sphere, which is an online forum, has a lot to do with conversions and technology. And a lot of people were interested in it as well. So uh, we ended up, uh, me and a close friend um, ended up getting together, uh, my partner, Alexi, and we opened up uh, EcoCycles in 2018. So, uh, yeah. Pretty much just started from making our own e-bikes and slowly evolved over time. And, you know, we decided to go for it. So Very good, David. All right. So now uh, uh, our audience, of course, is really interested in knowing how you became interested in the recumbent market and what you did with EcoCycles to point yourselves in that direction. So tell us about that a little. Absolutely. So, um, so you know, I, I really got into this whole thing. I wasn't, I didn't get into the e-bikes from being a cyclist. I actually came from the opposite end. Um, I, you know, I was never really into cycling that much. So, you know, I came in from the electric side of things. Um, I, I think it was also like right when we officially opened EcoCycles, I actually suffered multiple disc injuries and, you know, got a bunch of nerve damage in my right leg, unfortunately, and stuff like that. So, uh I, you know, started looking at different options and I had seen one or two in the past, but wasn't very familiar with recumbent trikes. Um, and so I, I started looking into that and looking at it as an option because by then I was hooked on riding and especially with electric assist. It was just a blast. So, uh, you know, I, I got familiar with them and I saw there was only a couple factory e-trikes out back then and they were expensive. And it was, you know, it was a, a big first step for me. And also I was I'm a fan of the do it yourself motors. Uh, not necessarily only because I like to do it myself, but also typically they have a they have a they're user serviceable, more user serviceable, at least than a lot of these big mainstream factory brands. And, um, you know, just a lot more customizable. 
So I started looking and said, saw there wasn't anything quite tailored the way I wanted. And there were some hub motor kits that, you know, I had moved on from hub motors just because I felt like mid drives had a lot more benefit. So uh, I just saw that there was a lack of really accessible and really tailored systems for recumbent trikes. So being such a fan of the TSDZ2 and already having worked with it um, to import it for the U.S. market, uh, we started making some changes and I uh, started gearing it towards recumbent trikes and just networking with the community um, you know, I have a, a associate uh, that runs a shop also in Canada who was given a lot of pointers, who was kind of pioneering it as well. And uh, we just slowly started making changes and, you know, getting some third party parts produced um, to tailor specifically the TSDC2, which was really the entry point for recumbent trikes. Excellent. Well, that's going to bring us right to my next question, which is uh, what products do you sell for the bent market? Is it just that one motor or do you have some options as well? Tell us what you have for the bent market. So, you know, our favorite and the one we, that we most specialize is the TSDZ2, the Tongsheng, which is the torque sensing. Um, you know, it's a great motor um, and it's pretty versatile. Um, and it's usually what we recommend. And that's definitely our main favorite one at the moment. That being said, we also do have the more common Bafang kits, which um, there are a few suppliers that offer that. Um, and we, we kind of have them going on the same wiring system. So it's really our one main kit is basically you can get it with the TSDZ2 with torque sensing. Or if your specific case requires it or it would be preferred, um, you know, if you got a heavier load, uh, you know, towing a trailer, uh, if you got really hilly terrain or, or you just really want more power, we have the Bafang kits too. So it's kind of the same wiring system, the same system, but then you can either have the Tongsheng that, you know, goes up to this power level or the Bafang, which we have the BBS-02 or the BBS-HD, which is just ridiculously heavy duty. Um, so uh, so that's that's our main three right there where it goes Tongsheng, Bafang, BBS-02, Bafang, BBS-HD. So that's our main ones right now. And by the time some people see this, um, we're about to release the newest version of the TSDZ2, which is has a new software, which is called Open Source Firmware, which essentially allows full customization of all the sys levels and a variety of features. So um, now it opens it up even further to so people can fully tune all the settings and get their assist levels dialed in just uh, like they like it. So the main one's definitely the TSDZ2, but a couple heavier duty options, and now uh, a fully customizable version of the TSDZ2 as well. And then aside from the actual motors kits that we provide, which of course we specialize in, um, for the accessory mounts, battery mounts, and other recumbent part needs, we are a distributor for T-Cycle products, TerraCycle. So uh, we're happy to represent and distribute for them as well. And we're happy to hear that because of course, uh, Pat and his crew are a huge sponsor of the Laid Back Bike Report. That's great news, David. Uh, guys, I think at this point we are going to show a video that uh, David put together that uh, focuses in on what they do at EcoCycles, and we're going to get a, a nice look at the uh, motors that they work on right now. Hi, I'm David with EcoCycles, and this is our recumbent trike model. This is an all-in-one system that fits virtually all recumbent trikes based on the TSDZ2 motor. We have this same configuration set up for recumbent trike models available with BBS mid drives as well. But TSDZ2 is generally our go to and what we specialize in, so we're going to focus on that. So the TSDZ2 started being imported in the US about five years ago, and we've worked with it extensively on various modifications and upgrades. But again, this is tailored specifically for recumbent trikes. Uh, what we do is basically have switched over the wiring system and added removable extensions to every part on this so it can ensure a good fit without too much loose wire and of course not enough. Other than that, we have switched out the anchor with what's known as a boom clamp and that secures tightly around your recumbent trikes boom. We have a variety of different sizes and some shims available to make sure you can always get a snug fit. Some other changes that we've made to the system include a different drive side crank. And the reason we did that is because the stock cranks are both curved, they have a little curvature to them, and the drive side typically is about an inch further from the center line, so there's an uneven Q factor. That can be real hard on your joints over time, so what we've done is 
switched out the right crank with the completely straight crank, and you can see the difference here. And what that does is bring the right side back in so it's balanced with the left and you have a symmetrical Q factor. Another modification that we've made is the inside gear that's the main drive gear immediately connected to the internal motor core. So what comes stock on these systems is a blue plastic gear and it's generally reliable and it doesn't give too many people problems. But if you're trying to pull the absolute maximum power out of this, you're in hilly terrain, have especially heavy load, pulling a trailer, something like that, you may want to upgrade to a stronger gear for reliability's sake. Now, the metal gear has been available for a while and it's a great solution, but it's got one issue and that is that it increases the sound from the motor. It, it's a, quite a bit noisier and it beds in over time, but still, you know, we like to keep things as quiet as possible. So what we have developed is a peak gear and peak is a superior composite of plastic. Um, not quite as strong as metal, but strong enough to where you'll never have an issue and without the increased noise. So it's a great solution. And if you know your ride, especially aggressively, hard gearing, heavier load, hilly terrain, really want to pull some power out of this, I recommend the Peak Gear. The motor comes with a 42 tooth chain ring and guard, but we have a variety of options depending on your wheel size and riding conditions. We've made a few other changes to the internal components, upgraded controller, there's some you know, firmware tweaking and a whole different firmware system we'll get into. But the main thing that makes this best suited for recumbent trikes is the wiring system. So we'll start off one at a time. You have three main lines coming off the TSDZ2. The first one is the battery line. And you see you have the main line going to an extension. Typically we have Anderson connectors on this. Going now all the way to the battery. We have a variety of different adapters so you can match it with virtually any battery. Um, but of course, you know, we also have our own batteries and we provide it plug and play ready to go. So coming to the battery, we offer T-cycle battery mounts. And these are great. And depending on what recumbent trike you have, you can get a variety of different clamps to make sure you got the perfect fit and uh, it's ready to go. We always recommend to have the extender, which is the piece right here in between the clamp and the vertical plate. Um, T-Cycle themselves only recommend this for certain models or especially when you mount it on the drive side so you can kind of extend it out past the chain line. Um, and in some folding models, you have to mount on the drive side anyways to avoid the latch system. That way you have clearance. The reason we always recommend the extender and to mount the battery on the drive side is so the battery ends up facing a certain way to where the line is pointed towards the motor and that the key is pointed to the outside. That way you always have easy access. And the base of these batteries typically mount and there's a quick release mechanism so you can bring the battery in, take it off the trike when you're transporting, et cetera, et cetera. Going back now to the beginning, we'll go to the second line, which goes to the speed sensor. And once again, we have a series of removable extensions on this that are different lengths and you can chain them together how you need. You can take out one, you can use them all, um, whatever suits, you know, the, the wire routing needs. So where you can get the sensor all the way back to the rear wheel is what we recommend. Sometimes people mount them on the front wheel and that is an option specifically if you have a mount for the speed sensor, but we tend to like mounting them on the rear wheel. So, the stock system just provides a normal speed sensor, but what we found is typically we would have too much of a gap between the speed sensor and the spoke magnet once it's on the spoke. And what needs to happen is it needs to be about a half inch, 10 to 15 millimeters away to consistently and accurately measure the speed. So instead of adding a little piece of wood or some sort of shim material behind the whole mount, what we did was switched out the internal bolt, added some spacers, and depending on how much you need to extend this out, you can move spacers in or out of this hollow head here. And if you put them in between the mount and the sensor, obviously it makes it wider. If you put them in the hollow space, I mean, you can make it closer. So it's adjustable and you can dial in that fit perfect. Now we have the main wiring harness, which leads to the display, 
optional throttle, and optional e-brakes. A lot of people opt to go without e-brakes due to the torque sensing responsiveness, and it's never been an issue. However, if you're choosing to go with a BBS mid-drive, which is a cadence-based system, we would consider e-brakes mandatory, as well as a gear sensor. And on that note, when it comes to the TSD Z2, we don't recommend a gear sensor, and there's not even a port for it. It's never been necessary, and no one's had a problem due to it not quite having that overwhelming power that the BBS does. For brake sensor options, we have a magnet sensor, which fixes to your lever and fixes to the body of your brake, and when you pull the lever, it separates, causing motor cut out immediately. This is typically recommended with hydraulic brakes. The other option is a through-line sensor, compatible with cable pull brakes, and you lace the cable through the sensor. That way, whenever you pull the lever, the cable moves, the sensor detects it, and cuts out your motor. As with all the other parts, we have removable extensions, so you can make sure you have enough wire um, to route as you need and remove it if you don't need the additional length. Next, we have the throttle, which is optional as well. And basically, if you want the option to just be able to trigger the motor for assistance just by pressing this and you can go without pedaling, you do have that as an option. The TSDZ2 throttle is governed to about half of the power you get from pedal assist in the highest pedal assist level, um, just for reliability purposes. The BBS system can put out full power at the touch of the throttle and is very strong, so you have to definitely use that responsibly. The last line from the main wiring harness goes to your display, which is not optional as you need it to display your speed, adjust the assist level up and down, and access the settings menu so you can configure your wheel size and battery voltage. We send it pre-configured with that information, but you may switch your battery or the trike that this is mounted on eventually, so it's good to be able to change those settings as needed. This also has removable extension like all the other parts, so everything is covered so you can get the good fit and add or remove extensions as needed, except for one part, and that is the button panel that goes to the display. This is a 10 inch line, but some people do choose to mount the button panel on the opposite handlebar from the display, or for example, their display on the boom. And in that case, we do offer additional extensions that you can put in between the 10 inch line here so you can route it as needed. We have this mounted on a cockpit mini T from T-Cycle, and we stock most of T-Cycle accessory mounts, but this is probably our most recommended one. And we think it's a really good fit where you can drop it right in your handlebar, have the throttle, if you choose one, right there on the inside where you can press it naturally without having to move your hand in awkward position, and you still have access to the controls right there. That's definitely our preferred display. This is the 860C display. It's an upgraded version of the 850. Uh, just real quick, you notice some points of the 850. You got the USB port underneath it. Um, you have the remote button panel, which has three buttons. You got a plus, a minus, and the power button, and you double tap the power to get in the menu. Um, you look behind it, you have a mount, it's fixed, comes out a little bit. Um, the 860C, uh, it's brighter in direct sunlight. It's a major thing. Um, it's got a slightly larger screen. You'll see the mount is a little bit slimmer, less intrusive, options of other things in the cockpit, and has articulating arms so you can angle it as needed. And the remote button panel has an extra menu button now. So it's a nice upgrade. So powered on, the EcoCycles logo. Uh, you'll notice the main screen, you have kilometers per an hour. We can switch that and we will. Um, this is your assist level, which, you know, up, down, switches it. Um, it's a little Eagle Cycles logo. The trip, that has your trip. Yeah, you can cycle it. Um, odometer, range. The range actually isn't functional in this or, or any 860C that we know. Um, then you got your max speed, you got your average speed. Obviously, this hasn't been used, so nothing's registered yet, but everything works other than the range. Um, if you hold up, it activates night mode, which activates the lights if it's connected. Hold it up again to go off. If you hold down, you'll see this goes to P, and it activates walk mode. And let go, and that's it. All right, so to get to the menu, what you do is you double tap and hold the M button. 
There we go. Okay. So there's only a few things that you can actually change in here. Um, the system metric, it was kilometers per an hour. We want that to go to Imperial, which is miles per an hour. Um, M selects, you know, makes it flash and then up and down, change it. And then M again chooses it. So the brightness, it's already fully turned up. You can set the brightness individually. If you enter the menu from night mode with the light on, um, you can set the brightness alternately for when it's in a uh, night mode. Auto off, you know, if it doesn't detect any speed or anything, it's just sitting after five minutes, it powers off. You can turn it up. You can turn it up to nine minutes or completely off. Scenes, analog, that can't be changed. It's just the style of the heads-up display is the way it shows speed. Um, battery indicator, um, you would have seen at the very beginning, it's just displaying the voltage. Um, you can change that to where it just has a percent, which we're gonna switch it to now, or off. Power indicator, uh, that's not an option to actually set. Clock, you know, you can set the clock. Um, this keeps the time too when it's off. If it ever, uh, if it ever loses uh, the setting for the time, um, what you'll need to do is turn auto off to off and then leave the display on hooked up to the battery for like a day or two and it'll charge the inside battery if you ever notice your clock's going off. Start password. If you'd like, you can set a password to use this, but caution, remember the password because if you lose your password, you will not be able to use your display. Um, you notice these this dot, dot, dot setting right there that goes to more. Um, wheel size, that way you can accurately Check your speed, um, 26 inch, whatever you know, set to whatever wheel size you have. Battery, if you have a 52 volt, 48 volt, or a 36 volt, um, that way the battery percent and everything is reading right. The USB port, you can charge it to, you know, set it to on or off so it will charge if it's needed. You have a light sensor. Um, the light sensor will automatically detect if it's light and automatically turn on night mode if it needs to. Um, you know, factory setting is just going to switch everything back to factory um, information. This will all, you know, be filled up eventually. Like I said, range is never going to work, but everything else does. But what we want to do is get into the advanced setting. And the password for advanced setting is 1919. It's like that on all of our displays. Uh, the speed limit, it's always in kilometers per an hour. Um, 60 is about 45. Um, if you set this to 45, it's about 28 miles an hour, which would be class three. Uh, you know, you set it to 30 and it's about 20, which could be for class two if you don't use the throttle. Um, current limit, pose and motor, all this, leave this like it is. Don't change any of this. Um, the only thing that you need to change in advanced setting, possibly speed limit. Everything else does not need to be changed. That's set specifically for the TSDZ2, or if you get the Bafang version, it's already set for the Bafang. What you can adjust is also the the assist levels. Don't do UBE, set it on this. For this is the Tongsheng, you do five, four, three, two, yeah, three, or I guess that's it, three, four, or five. I leave it at five, you have the most assist levels for this. With the Bafang, you can set up to nine. Um, that's all that gets changed from this display. Um, the only other thing to note is with the TSDZ2, there is no watt meter along the bottom, it's not compatible, but with the BBS, um, there is a watt meter around the bottom. This is our fully customizable firmware. You turn it on with a long press of the power button. And once it's on, you'll see the assist level, which you can adjust up or down, and it has up to nine levels. You can set it for anywhere from one through nine. It has the speedometer, which of course is zero since they're not going. Right now it's displaying kilometers per an hour, but of course you can set it to miles per an hour. And you have four fields and a graph. Obviously, the graph hasn't started charting, but once you start going and it fills in, it will it will show as you go along. And the time right now, it's going to 15 minutes. But if you're riding for an hour, for example, um, it extends and automatically adjusts. Now, if you switch your assist level to zero and press the power button just with a short press, it pops up the assist mode. You have hybrid assist, power assist, torque assist. Cadence Assist, and E-Mountain Bike Assist. Generally, usually we don't recommend E-Mountain Bike or Cadence Assist for recumbent trikes, and we recommend you stick with Torque, Power, or Hybrid. Hybrid is what we use most. You press the power button again, a short press, and it sets. That's only when you're in assist level zero. When you're in any other assist level, if you hold the menu button, you'll notice 
the field will start flashing. You can customize these parameters to show several different variables, used watt hours, watt hours per kilometer, which is showing you how much battery you're using for a distance, um, battery information, cadence, motor power, human power, all sorts of things. Short press with the power button sets that and goes to the next one, goes to the next one, goes to the next one, and the graph as well. Long press of the M button gets out of the setting mode. Now also when the assist level is on anything but zero, a short press of the power button will switch these four variables and the graph. You can set up to three screens to show whatever information you want and cycle between them with a the short press of the power button. Now to access the menu, press and hold the plus and minus button and then the power button as well immediately after and it goes into the menu. There's a lot of options here, but generally you don't have to worry about most of them. Um, we have a whole manual and we're happy to help you configure this as you need. But generally there's only a few settings you need to worry about. We already send these pre-configured, but just to make sure your speed's accurately measured, you can go into wheel. You can also set the max speed, but the circumference is adjustable by the millimeter. So you can really dial in that speed reading. Short press of the power button goes out. Scroll down, we go to assist levels. Assist levels, you can set anywhere from one to nine. Short press of the menu button sets it. Now you can change the assist for power, torque, cadence, and e-mountain bike individually. So the different modes, you can adjust the levels individually. The hybrid mode is a mix of the power and torque assist. So it automatically splits the difference. Short menu button accesses it, accesses it, and then you have level one through nine. If you only set four levels, it only uses the first four. If you set six, it uses the first six. So obviously, no matter what you have nine to, if you only have five levels, it's never going to reach nine. So you'd want your max level if you want to raise it. You, you know, whatever, if your max level is four, you'd want to raise four. But either way, on each one of these levels, you either raise the number or lower it. Raising, giving more assist, lowering, giving less assist. So you can fine tune the assist levels and make sure you just really dial this thing in and you're getting the amount of assist that you want for your riding style. There's a lot of other options in here, including a diagnostic menu that will show you the various readings for troubleshooting purposes if anything comes up. And of course, you can go into the display menu, set the clock, set the units, that way it shows up as miles per an hour and a variety of other things. We like to keep it simple and recommend just changing the assist level and making sure that wheel size is dialed in. But if you ever need to adjust the battery settings, of course, you can set it for whatever battery you have paired with the system. And the battery meter is accurate down to 1%. Could you tell us about your uh, support for the customers that are installing the EcoCycle motors? How do you support those folks? Uh, what, can, what should they expect from EcoCycles after they buy a motor from you? So we have a variety of documentation, diagrams for installation, things like that. Um, and that's ever grown. We're always working on it. We actually have a, a good wave of new things. I've supplied some, so maybe you can you know show them there on the screen. Um, you know, typically, if there's any issues, we ask that people shoot us an email, you know, give us the rundown. Lots of times we'll have to supply like a file or a diagram or something like that, and we can solve it very quickly. So it's, you know, nice to open up that line of contact. If people prefer, of course, our phone lines are always open, one eight three three my e bike So, you know, any issues, any questions, anything, you know, just reach out. Working with shops, what does that mean as far as working with existing uh, local bike shop? Yeah, as of right now, we're definitely mostly direct to consumer. But, uh, I, you know, uh, more and more shops are reaching out to us. We're at the point in time now to where we're doing, you know, more direct consumer outreach, but we're also reaching out to shops and just getting the word out about the brand because we think it's a great option. Um, you know, not everybody can go to a shop and just pick up a ready to go, 
you know, electric trike. So it's a good option for them to have a conversion kit. And we know plenty that offered the buffet kits, but we've kind of been spreading the word about our torque sensing kit. I, you, I like I like shops. Generally. Yeah. So what yeah. you like to do is because, like have people come into a shop and say, look, I really like to get a conversion. I want like to get e-assist on my trike. What do you have? And you'd like one of the options from the shop to be eco cycles. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, it's it's not only it, it's good because, uh, you know, for obviously on our end, uh, it's uh, when with a shop, we can kind of educate the owners and the mechanics there and then, you know, process a lot of kits at once. And it's, you know, easy, it's it kind of lets us reach more people through them because, you know, instead of us supplying 10 people and supporting 10 people, we supply a shop, teach them, and then they supply 10 plus people. And it kind of just has the butterfly effect, you know? Um, and just also, it's nice. Some people reach out to us and say, Hey, do you know any shops that can install this? Because I really like this system, but I'm not comfortable installing it myself. I'd like a shop to. And a lot of shops actually don't install third party kits. But if we, uh, you know, already correspond with the shop and have provided them documentation, advice, and support. Um, you know, they're a lot more open to it. So it actually opens up options for the retail consumer as well. Uh, as a customer, I'm de- I have decided that I want uh, an EcoCycles motor. I go on your website uh, and uh, I, I pick out something I'm interested in. Maybe I give you a call on that number. Tell me about uh, the range of, of pricing uh, for the motors. I know it may depend on a few things. And uh, when can a customer expect to have that motor shipped to them uh, in terms of the amount of time it takes to get to them. All right, so if you need the whole shebang, the motor, an accessory mount to mount the display, you know, an optional throttle, uh, a battery and a battery mount to mount the battery, of course, it's gonna run anywhere from about 1250 to 1750. And that's kind of a wide range, but a lot of that is because there's such a wide range in battery. Um, you can get a small battery, you can get a huge battery with lots of range. So that's where the main fluctuation comes from. And then the other would be if you get the TSDZ2 just plain, if you get it with some upgrades and modifications, or if you're upgrading to the, you know, the BBS HD, which is a little more expensive. For shipping times, typically everything we have on the website is in stock and ready to ship. Um, the batteries, you know, go right out the door. The kits get put together according to the selections made and then tested immediately before shipping. It's typically only a couple of days lead time. During peak periods, it may be a few days. Uh, nothing ridiculous. You know, we'd reach out if that does happen. Um, we generally keep everything pretty smooth. If you get any modifications, upgrades, uh, you know, different gears installed, that could add a couple of days too. But generally, we get everything out the door pretty quick. Great. All right. So, David, let's finish up with uh, a, a look into the future for EcoCycles, if we could. Why don't you tell us uh, what you guys have in mind uh, for the future? What's coming up for you guys? Absolutely. So, um, so you know, we we really got the TSDZ2, which is our main favorite kit at the moment, uh, to a really sweet spot. We're really happy with it. Um, you know, we just got the last of some newly produced components in that we, you know, really feel just takes it to the next level in reliability. Um, so now what we're really doing is focus on customer outreach, um, focusing on networking with some shops, um, just making it an all around more accessible option for people and uh, just working on that. We've we're not really planning on making any ready to go complete recumbent trikes. Uh, we feel like that is pretty well covered already by, you know, the bigger brands and the big factories. Um, we're really just focusing on making more accessible um, kits for either to do it yourself or, or one that you can go and get put on by a shop and uh, something that, you know, with a, with all the replacement parts available um, and just user serviceable if that's what you, you know, choose to do. So, that's uh that's what we're really focusing on now is is really getting the word out in the near future there are some new things we have planned we can't talk too much about it but just to tease it there is a, a little bit of a higher end motor coming out and you know we're hoping to have it maybe near the end of the year but you know with the with the supply chain it's it's been a challenge so we have to be patient um, but it's also torque sensing and uh, it's silent and has a wide range of application. You know, it can be used with lower power. It can be used with higher power. Um, we really think it's going to be a game changer for the market. So you keep an eye out for that in the near future. 
Now that sounds interesting. We will. We'll keep uh, we'll keep a close eye on that and keep in touch with you on that. So, folks, I guess to summarize, if you're looking to add an e-assist uh, motor to your uh, recumbent trike, uh, David and EcoCycles is a great place to do that. I might add, if you're a recumbent bike shop out there too, you might also want to get in touch uh, with with David. It sounds like he's got a plan for you. If you're not already doing this, or if you're looking for a partner, it sounds like uh, EcoCycles might be a good choice for you too. So reach out to David for that. So David Hall, thank you so much for uh, spending some time with us and letting nice us, know, letting about us know about EcoCycles. I appreciate your time. Thanks, appreciate for your time. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. Wow, a little bit of echo there. Hi, David. How you doing? Great. We're so glad you were able to uh, produce those uh, videos uh, for us and uh, that you can be with us live today to answer some questions. And we've got a bunch. I've got some. And uh, panelists, by the way, if you have any questions for David, uh, just shoot us a message on private chat and I'm going to bring you up here at the end. Uh, David, let's start maybe with uh, some of the questions in the live chat that I'd like you to answer. You answered some of them already directly. That's fine. But I think they're of general interest. So let's bring them up and see if you can uh, help out our viewers here. First of all, let's see. Here's one from Lost JR. Talk about the torque sensing with your system. So maybe people don't really understand uh, what torque sensing is, and only one of the motors, I think, has it. Tell us a little bit about torque sensing and how they fit in with your systems. So what torque sensing is, and, and I guess to really explain it well, I give a kind of a, in contrast to cadence sensing, which a lot of people are familiar with. Cadence sensing would be a system that's pedal assist to where if the cranks are turning, if the pedals are going, you have one set amount of power and it is basically an on-off switch. If the cranks are moving, it's on. If they're not moving, it's off. So just one power. Torque sensing, what it does is an assist level is actually the multiplication factor. So say, for example, you have just, for example, five levels of assist. Say the first level assist adds 33% to your power. So however hard you're pedaling, you'll get an extra 33% of the force that you are putting in, which the motor will you know, put out an additional 33%. Say assist level two goes to 75. Then, you know, assist level two, however hard you're pushing, you know, that torque sensor measures that force in watts. And then the motor's putting out an additional 75% of that of that wattage. Um, assist level three, say it's 150%. Assist level four, 200%, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So the torque sensing, it just senses how much input you are putting and then we'll add an additional amount corresponding to whatever assist level you're in, which again is basically a multiplication factor. Okay. Um, so, and there is a distinction between the two motors that you have as far as torque sensing goes? Yeah, absolutely. Wanna, this, this might be a good time for us to take a, a quick look at, at the two different motors and uh, the distinction sure. between them. Absolutely. So um, first I'll show you the Bifang, the BBSO2. So this is probably... Uh, by far the most common motor that you'll see a lot of shops use, um, you know, Bafang. Um, and, uh, and this is cadence sensing. So if these cranks are turning, it's putting out a set amount of power, period. You know, you can up the amount of power with a different assist level, but the power doesn't fluctuate depending on how hard you're pedaling or anything. It's just on or off, turning on, not turning off. So a lot of people are going to be familiar with this BBSO2 system, you know, and you got, uh, they're very... Other than the torque sensing and the cadence sensing, they're very similar. This one does have a little bit more power, um, a lot more power than most people need. And sometimes it can be a little jerky. We program them pretty smooth. But uh, in the chain rings, typically come in about 44T. They're all, they're all come with a with a guard that's integrated. 44T to about 52T. Those are the common sizes. You know, we, we can usually work out an adapter and things like that. But uh, that's uh, what's typically it. So then you have the TSTZ2 system which you see looks a little bit different. You can tell it's a little bit smaller. And uh, yeah, so this is our, you know, favorite system, definitely. And this is really, th this we think suits almost everybody. This, you know, rarely does a person's situation really require the BBS. Um, so this is usually what we're going towards. And this is, of course, the torque sensing system. So, you know, very similar, you know, it slides in, you know, to the crank, slides into where your bottom bracket goes. You know, slides into where the cranks and just replaces the cranks. Both of them go to the same spot. So uh, very similar build, very similar look. But the assist system 
is uh, very different. All right. And that, you know, you, you mentioned the cranks there. So let's, let's bring up Matthew McDonough's question. Uh, do people run shorter cranks on e-assist? Absolutely. And we actually have some 152 millimeter cranks, which are pretty short. I see a lot of people have like 155 and stuff. The stock cranks are 170. And uh, if you had noticed in the video, uh, we uh, switch out the right crank to kind of equalize the Q factor because there's a few quirks in these designs. And that's like one of the things that we looked at whenever we made our changes, because um, you want the Q factor symmetrical. If it's not, and someone like me without a cycling back around oh. and it's really hard on your joints uh if the q factor is not even you're you know got a got a cock step there so um if the 170 is not good and you want to go shorter we have some 152 the only issue is the drive side is a little bit further out now you can use a spacer on the left side a, a pedal extender that's about 20 millimeters and that will make it dead even the only thing is that's going to widen the q factor as opposed to how we slim it down to equalize it. So 152s are a good option. It's going to be a little bit off center on one, unless if you widen it 20 millimeters. It's still not crazy wide, nowhere near a fat bike, but that's, you know, the trade-off. Very good. All right. Let's jump to this next one. And now we, we talked, price is always something that people are concerned about. I thought you explained Absolutely. it pretty well uh, during the video. So, you know, how, how does someone get it down to, you know, five or 600 bucks? Is that a possibility? What, what do you suggest for folks who are on a very limited budget? So, yeah, that's always a challenge because I mean, there's different systems and like, for example, if you're really wanting to go, you know, uh, as economic as possible, there are hub motor systems um, that are much more economically priced. Um, where you don't want to compromise is the battery because it's good to save some money, but not when you're getting into a situation that's not safe and, and batteries are nothing to play with. So that's that's the the one thing that I strongly caution people about because a lot of people will look at deals. Oh, I see this, you know, on eBay, on Amazon, and you know, some of it's a little bit sketchy to you know to put it to euphemistically state it, I guess. Um, but uh, yeah, as as far as these, you know, it's it's hard to get them much lower than we do really to where they're you know actually tailored. We have been looking at putting like a budget system out, and in the near future, we might be able to release something like that or a special. Um, in that case, it would probably be pedal assist only with no throttle, um, a budget display where it's just up and down with assist levels, not too many options, um, and and something like that. Keep it a lot simpler. But yeah, it's, it's hard to bring the price down. And, and I know someone, for example, was looking for a, a whole system for 500. That's going to be a real challenge. And we actually, you know, once we get everything in wholesale and, you know, buying hundreds of units, it's uh, it's still considerably over 500, even directly from the manufacturer importing on a large basis. So it, it's a challenge to get it that, that far down. But, you know, we'll see what the market does in the future. Now is a little bit of an unstable time in importing and all that. So it's it's unfortunately prices have shot up from last year. But you'd think in the coming years, you know, kind of as the market expands and then settles that the price of some electrics just should come down. That's what we're hoping for. All right. How about the square boomed uh, frames that uh, many trikes have. Um, Absolutely. Can you can you do something? Because we saw the uh, clamp that you have was a round one. What can you do exactly. for square booms? So now I'm sure, you know, the battery mounts now, to, to skip away from the booms, but the battery mounts, T-Cycle, of course, provide square boom clamps uh, that work great. Now you could likely rig up a square boom clamp uh, because they make the battery mount clamps for the main frame, but then they also have ones for boom for Terra, Trike, um, Green Speed, stuff like that. So, uh, what uh what we do though is we still use a circle clamp and i'm holding this but it's not square but we use a circle clamp even on the square booms we just have a bigger one and then it still catches and holds strong and then you know you have a little uh you have that little leftover channel that it creates and we route the wires through that and then that way you know that's one less zip tie or however you're you know hiding the wires and securing them to the frame that you have to use so we still think a, a larger circle clamp works absolutely fine on the square booms but it's, you know, it's not too terrible to rig up something. And again, you could probably rig up one of those professional T-cycle square booms to, to the system and it just bolts in. So we, we, we might check that out a little bit in the future going forward. 
All right. Lost JR wants to know, you did talk all about uh, forming uh, relationships with uh, local bike shops uh, around uh, the country. So is there a list maybe on your website? Uh, how do folks go about, uh, if they're not wanting to install it themselves, how do they go about finding a local bike shop that might be interested? in? Working so with? we don't have anything on our website yet. And in the future, we may put, you know, oh, find a distributor and, and that sort of thing. Um, honestly, right now, uh, our model is really direct to consumer and we're just more and more reaching out to shops. I noticed that, uh, for example, one of your sponsors, I know that we do some business with, so that's great. Um, but, uh, just being that, being that a lot of, uh, shops don't install third party systems. The only really shops we could refer someone to is the ones that we, uh, do business with. So if someone reaches out to us and, and is asking us and we know someone in their area, then we advise, but, you know, we don't quite have enough spread on the map yet uh, to where it's really like I think would be worth making a, a session devoted to it. We're literally right in the phase now to where we're really scaling up and we've kind of got our operations down smooth, everything getting automated. And we're trying to get to that part now to where we're really working on getting the word out and spreading the distribution and get everything a lot more standardized. And that's exactly what we're working on expanding now to make this much more available to everybody um, with documentation to do it themselves or with a network of shops to do it for them. Okay, very good. Our pal Peter Houston uh, asks about a twist throttle. So we saw that little thumb throttle you have there. Is there an option for a twist throttle? Absolutely. Um, I don't think we have, we may not actually have any full twist throttles uh, on the website, but they're easy to get. And if you find a yellow three pin twist throttle that works with a Bifang. Um, it will also work on the TSDZ2 because we did convert to that same yellow three pin connector. We have a, a half twist, which we actually prefer a lot more. And I think especially on a recumbent, it might be easier uh, to fit a half twist on there and still be able to get everything else. But, um, but they're readily available, um, although we do not really have the selection of the full twist ready to go. They're, they're very easy to find. And if you needed one and shoot us an email, you know, I'm sure we got some in the bin. It's yes, yeah, they're very, they're very readily available. All right, good. I I don't understand what this is. Maybe you do. If not, we'll move along. And uh, Mr. R B T Gold, is there is the peak gear available on your website? So not yet. And the peak gear was uh, the gear that we previewed. That was kind of the white plastic. Ah. Oven. That's, that's the third generation now. And it is absolutely perfected. The last step was beveling the edges on the teeth there a little bit more. And then uh, putting in a collar on the backside around the needle bearing to ensure retention and that there's no flex from behind the needle bearing. Um, because you'll notice the stock blue plastic uh, had, that, had that metal collar around it, hold it. To where the metal gear didn't because the whole gear is metal um those uh i don't know if they're out of production yet but last i had heard the big batch of the third generation was in production and we were expecting them within 30 days i want to knock that down to about three weeks now so they will be available soon um we'll definitely be offering them immediately with kits uh i'm not sure um, we got to look at the situation and see if we're going to offer them standalone. We'll definitely offer them standalone for previous motor customers, um, but it's very hard to get in and we've been waiting. So the first batch will primarily be for whole motor kits as an option. Uh, but of course, again, we will offer them to pre-existing motor customers. And then the next step for that is we'll, they'll be listed standalone just once we get the supply, you know, smoothed out and we're not backed up because we got a lot of people waiting on that. Super. All right. User Toga. Have any for fat bikes or fat trikes for that matter? Are there some changes that are necessary for a fat uh, tired uh, bikes and trikes? Absolutely. Now, I've only ran into one type of trike that had a longer bottom bracket than 68 to 73 millimeters. Now, basically, every one I've ever seen has been 68 millimeters, not even 73. But I have done, I don't know if it was a Sunseeker fat tad. I'm trying to remember. But I have ran into one that had 100 millimeters. Now, I wish I could pop up a, a picture here, but I don't see that I can. But uh, we actually designed an extension for the TSDZ2. Um, and uh, what it does is it just literally, um, it extends this right here, and it's a new spindle. So it's a new spindle and then extends the shaft so it slides in and you get the full clearance. And we have them in 100 millimeter and 120 millimeter. So we literally designed that ourselves. We have a big jig that you need to use with a lathe. And then it threads the inside of this to where you, you know, thread it in. 
Um, so it was quite extensive, but we do have those. We have motors already fabricated and ready to go. Uh, right now on the website, we don't have a specific um, fat bike model, um, but what you do is you just pick whatever TSDZ2 model you want, and then you also purchase the extension in the cart, and we just go ahead and send it to you. We'll probably confirm if you don't even know asking for it to be installed. Now, that's for the TSDZ2. When it comes to the BBS02, there are no fat bike models, but the BBS HD, which is like the big brother to BBS02 and ridiculously powerful, um, that is available in 100 and 120 millimeter. Uh, but that's most vendors will have that because that was made by the manufacturer. Very good. All right. So our buddy Al Henriksen in Sweden. Al, hi. I'm glad you're watching today. I like to pedal hard so that I don't use so much battery power. What sensor system is best if I want to save power? So um, honestly, I mean, I feel like the obvious answer would be the torque sensing system. But to me, to, if you're going to go by the numbers and just the data, either one, because what it would be is if you just want to pedal more and use less input, if you have the BBS, you can program the SIS level one to be, you know, barely any power. And just like the TSDZ2, level one doesn't use that much power. It will use more if you push it. But if you do the OSF, you can lower the power of the, of the SIS level two. So, I mean, realistically, either one, you just make sure that assist output is set very low and you just stay disciplined to keep it in the low assist level instead of cranking it up like I do sometimes. All right. Here's a good question from my buddy David Lowe. Does it void my warranty on, he's talking about ice, but of course this is a legitimate question for anybody's brand of trike that they are adding to. Does it void their warranty? Now, I would say for any questions like this, that obviously you will have to refer to um, the distributor or the manufacturer, but I can all but guarantee you, yes, it would. Typically any changes you make whatsoever are gonna void the warranty in any of these factory bikes or trikes. All right. Here's one I don't know if you can answer or how familiar you are, uh, but we do have a, a great Velomobile following on this show. We talk about them all the time. We're going to talk about them at the end of this show. Mm -hmm. And the question from Mike Smith is, would this work on a Velo like the Wow from Katanga? Would it work on a Velomobile? So actually, yes, we have um, helped people do quite a few Velomobiles. Um, if you go on our website to the customer gallery, which is under some revisions, we're working on the website, but uh, there's a couple of Velomobiles with the TSDZ2 um, that you can see. Very nice. Some people, you know, put the screen directly into the dash and it's like, it just looks great. Um, now, it depends on some, there's a lot going on around where the bottom bracket goes in around the crank. And sometimes there are obstructions. Sometimes you have to do a little something, rig up a different boom clamp. Sometimes you can rig it without a boom clamp. So you really just have to look to where you're inserting into, you know, into the bottom bracket shell and make sure there's nothing obstructing it. And, you know, once again, you know, it just, it just slides right in. So, you know, if you can, if you can see, one thing is that the shell, if it's too thick, you know, it would, it, you have to be able to slide it in, in between this space here, you know? So, uh, that's one thing. And then, uh, and then, it, you know, if there's just anything sticking out weird that's obstructing it, obviously that can be an issue. The only other thing is uh, typically when we've done any installs with Velomobiles, that uh, there's, that's been the one case to where we've needed a little bit more extensions than we readily supply, just because there's kind of a lot of times they're routing it all the way outside around the shell or something like that. But that's simple. You just throw in an extra extension. So so right, yeah, right. Yeah, possible. you have all the connections yeah, we saw. Right, right. Good. Okay. And then I'm going to make this the last question from the live chat uh, from Carl Bosworth. This is not a question. This is a testimonial. Carl says, I got a T TSD system from uh, last summer from David from Iazab and have been very pleased with it. So you can just blush or thank I, him. I, or I'm trying not to. <laughs> well, thank, thank you, you, Carl. Appreciate, That's, appreciate that. That's really nice. Now, exactly. I have a question. Uh, Larry, can you pop Denny up quickly? Denny, you can ask this uh, of David yourself, if you like. Denny, well, go ahead. What's your question? How's it going, Denny? Denny, you are muted, as usual, pal. There we go. Yeah. All right. Good. Yeah, I have a question about the weight. Uh, I noticed that it looks lighter than the Bafang. 
And uh, what's the weight range? I know your 36, 48, 54 volt system. So what's the weight range on the motor crank system? So the TSDZ2 itself is about eight pounds. So it's a little bit lighter. Um, and then the battery, you know, small batteries, right. you know, under five pounds. These bigger batteries typically are right around 10 to 12 pounds, depending on the size of them. Okay. So uh, is there any difference in the weight between the, the 36, uh, outside of the battery, because I, I realize the battery's uh, going to be, but outside of, uh, is is the 36 volt motor going to be lighter than the uh, 48 or the 54 volt motor? No, they're, they're well, maybe by an ounce. Um, the difference, the only hardware difference is the motor core but they're very similar. The difference is the 36 volt motor core has thinner copper windings okay. and a few more where the other one has thicker wind copper windings and okay. a few less. That so makes it's about sense. the same way. Okay, cool. Thanks. Thank you, Denny, for the question. All right, we're going to wrap this up, but I'm going to reserve the very last question for myself. Uh, in that video, you were showing the controls and one of the things you said was, this is for the walk mode. Mm -hmm. the heck is a walk mode? So walk mode, uh, honestly, I don't really recommend it for recumbent trikes. Uh, although lots of times you can use it in diagnostics and stuff like that. Uh, what walk mode is, let me see, you can turn this on here. The Bafang, and, and just uh, for heads up before we get to this, the Bafang, if it doesn't have a speed sensor hooked up, it goes into error mode rather quickly um, just because it's not picking up the speed. But so you go into walk mode and you hold it down and... Well, and you don't hold down the power button because then you turn it back off. But uh, <laughs> so here you go. So you go into walk mode and you'll see it just slowly rotates. So typically, if you were at a hill too steep to walk up on a normal bicycle, you'd hop off and walk up and then that kind of propels itself. Um, but when it comes to trikes, pretty much we just use it for diagnostics or testing on the stand, that sort of thing. All right. Thank you. That explains that. And lastly here, Al Henriksen, we were talking about the Velomobile. You were explaining putting your uh, motors into them. And Al, who knows a lot about this, says for Velomobiles, there are special made Bafang bottom bracket housings to get the motor into the center. So that's uh, a little uh, treat. That, uh, a little trick that, that we can use. Yeah, so sure. thanks again, Alba. All right. I think we are going to leave it there for today. David, thank you so much once again for sharing your vast knowledge and all the interesting products uh, and services that you offer there at EcoCycles. Um, I'm guessing we're going to have you back on when you uh, maybe get that new system uh, that you're talking about in the future. And uh, I'm sure people are going to be asking questions of you folks. Of course, as always, we're going to have EcoCycles uh, links below. Everything that uh, David talks about should hopefully be in that website. If not, you can get a hold of him through the links there. And uh, I think that's where we're going to leave it today. David Hall, thank you so much for Thanks being for on the way back. Me. Me. All right, pal. We'll see you soon. Okay, thanks. Let's move along, guys. Um, we are now going to head into uh, France and talk uh, with the race director for the World Championships this year, which is being held this summer. And uh, his name is Mark LeSeward, and he is going to talk to us today about those World Championships. Larry? Well, guys, I am here with Mark LeSeward. From France, and he is going to talk to us about the uh, 2022 World Championships in France. Mark, how are you today? Hello, I'm fine. Uh, hello to everybody. Let me uh, ask you a couple of questions here, Mark. Can you tell us a little bit about your recumbent history? So, uh, actually, I started recumbent uh, about 20 years ago. Um, at the time, it was for commuting, and that I, I wanted to find a a bicycle which were more which was more comfortable than a normal bicycle and and I tried it and I loved it so uh, I purchased my first recumbent which was a challenge hurricane and then uh, from then on uh, I started to look at competition and uh, racing and uh, started to enter some races uh, in France and then some races in inter international races and uh, it was a whole new world for me and, and have you been successful activity. racing <laughs> uh well not very successful but uh, i think i won a few titles uh, in france 
French national champion. A well, that's of, something. That's wonderful. Yeah, we were three probably at the time, but <laughs> that's very that nice. counts. <laughs> okay. Well, so then that led you to get involved with uh, the racing organizations, I guess, in in France. Tell me about the the main racing organization, the AFV. Can you tell me about that? Yeah, the AV is the Association Française de Vélo Couché, uh, which uh, is focused on developing a recumbent bicycle, uh, velomobile, trikes, uh, handbikes, um, as well as normal uh, two-wheel recumbents. Um, originally, there was another association in France, which is called France, France HPV, which is uh, more or less uh, dormant, uh, sleeping now. So the AAV is the leading uh, association in France. And um, we started organizing uh, international, international races uh, in 2014, uh, I think. And uh, actually, that's our third organization uh, with this association. Very nice. And now, so you were involved right from the start with the AFV? Yeah, I was actually I was involved in the France HPV Association in 2006 when we organized the first French, uh, f- w- the first World Championships in France. Uh, that was in Allegre in 2006, and from then on, I I was always involved in the the organization uh, with. Uh, most often a, a very small uh, team of organizers, but uh, very dynamic, and uh, we managed to to do things quite well at the end, I think. Most All people right. Now, so, uh, Mark, tell me what you do with the, uh, in the organization. What are your duties? So my, my main duty is the race organization. Uh, I'm uh, the official race dir- director in the World Championships. Uh, I'm also involved in into the international re, uh, relations uh, with other associations. I participate to the European uh, Supino uh, magazine, in, uh, online magazine. I'm probably uh, uh, registered in most of the forums <laughs> around in in Britain, in uh, America, uh, in Germany. So uh, I post information in most of the forums in uh, in the world very good let's go ahead and focus in on the uh, on the event itself can you tell us a little bit about the uh, the 2022 uh, world championships sure that's why I'm here tonight um, so uh, this edition of the world championship will be held in Orgelais. Uh, Orgelais is a a small town uh, in the Jura region in France. Um, as you can see on the picture here, it's a, a lovely little village with a, a, a center which is a historical with a church and many buildings which which are quite uh, quite nice. And it's uh, in a, in an area with, which has a lot of green hills and uh, and rivers, and it's uh, very green. It's one of the parts of France which as a lot of rain in the, in spring and <laughs> it's always very uh, very green so actually uh, that's not the first time as i said before that uh, uh, the AAV is organizing uh, uh, world championships uh, actually in france we did uh, already three editions in 2006 in allegre in 2014 in Saône, in 2019 in nordax and in 2022 in orgelais and below, I've listed all the, the locations of uh, the World Championships in the past years. I think I've 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 I've, uh, I've competed in in most of them <laughs> during those years. Probably I started in cycle vision in the Netherlands in 2004 or something like that. And um, one of the particularity of the the French World Championships is that we we are keen. Uh, about uh, hilly uh, uh, circuits. So we are riding on open roads uh, with some hills, 
So what that makes the, the the specificity of the 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 World Championships in France. So it's not something very usual because generally in the Netherlands, in Britain, we race on tracks which are relatively flat. Yes, in France, we we try to 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 race on different kind of terrain. So just a little bit of background about the location of Orgelet. It's uh, east of France. It's not too far from Switzerland. It's not too far from northern Italy. It's not too far from south of Germany. So it's relatively convenient to, to reach from Western Europe. Of course, we would like to see more competitors from further away, uh, from uh, Northern America, Canada, United States of America, Brazil, Mexico. But it's, I know it's not so easy to, to travel such a long distance and it can cost a lot of money. I know that there is a, also a large community in Asia, in China, Japan, but uh, it's the same for them. It's not, not so easy to, to come. But we will welcome you very well. <laughs> Be sure of that. So as I said, um, Orgelet is located in some hilly terrain. And you can see on the picture on the right that uh, it's located next to river. And uh, actually, the, the the red circle that you can see is the will be the headquarters of the organization. It's uh, a sports center which is close to the river. Right. So now we look at the map of uh, of the locations of all the of the races which will which, which will take place. So in Orange here we have the hill race, which will be starting next to the headquarters uh, at the sports center. And we have the sprints on the very long line, uh, straight line uh, next to Orgelet. And then we have uh, the race criterium on a, on a circuit, which will take, which will take uh, some, some very nice roads with some hills and some downhills. So it could be quite fun. I've tested the circuit on my bike, and uh, bike, and uh, I must admit it's it's very it's not so easy, but it's uh, very fun to 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 ride. Now let's have a look specifically at the hill race. Um, so you can see that uh, we have our, the race track is in blue on the map. It starts from the sports center, and then. Uh, we will do it in in two heats. So the length of the of the climb is two point seven five kilometers. That's probably something like two miles. And the positive uh, elevation is one hundred twenty two meters. So we'll do it twice. And there will be a uh, starting groups of the same category. So unfair bikes, semi fair bike, fully fair on trikes. And then there is a, a liaison parkour in orange on the map where we will come back to the starting line for the second hit. It will be uh, the same setup as we did in Nandax in 2019. So group start and with, uh, with timekeeping uh, at the start and at the top of the hill. Let's move on to the, to the sprint now. So it's a straight line from point one to point two on the map there. It's pretty flat. And then on this straight line, we will do the 200 flying, 200 meter flying start and the one kilometer standing start. And probably for the one kilometer standing start, it will be like a drag race uh, with a simultaneous uh, start with, uh, of two people at the same time. As you can see on the picture, that's what we did in Nandax in 2019 as well. The main course of the championships, the Criterium, which is a, a circuit of 10.5 kilometers, uh, that we will uh, look for 10 times, so that's about 100 kilometers. And the positive uh, the elevation is uh, quite high, so it will be a difficult track, but uh, I think uh, most people will enjoy it anyway because uh, of, the, of the bends on the downhill, uh, which makes it uh, quite fun to ride. Actually, there will be a, a group start from the the town of Orgelet, where we will follow a, a pace car. And then we go to the starting uh, in Rotonet, which is there, the, the small village. There will be a starting grid based on the previous uh, ranking of the of the races, the previous races. And then they will start uh, for 10 loops. Uh, here I just indicate 
the way we in which uh, the, the points are calculated. So it's uh, what we did in uh, Nandax in 2019 as well. So actually, uh, the points uh, reflect your ranks, your, your ranking, but also the 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 the, um, the relative speed or the the relative speed you have with respect to the best uh, of the competitors. So. You have a reward for being well ranked, but you have a reward for being fast as well. So, so it's good for uh, it. Can, it encourages tactics, as I wrote, wrote here, because uh, not only you need to be well placed, but you need to, not to be too slow to 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 be able to to compete with the, the best. Uh, just a, a word about the, the accommodation on the meals. Uh, as I said, most of the people will be. Uh, uh, Accommodated in the sports center, that's a top-notch uh, sports center which is used by Olympic teams, uh, French Olympic teams, in rowing. And uh, and in 2022, uh, we have the opportunity opportunity to use that. So that's why we choose this date because we have only this year, well, it when it will be available for us. And so it's uh, we have uh, all the facilities, a swimming pool, uh, the rooms are quite nice. Uh, it's relatively cheap compared to hotel. You can actually uh, install a tent. There is a small pitch where you can install a tent on, on site if you don't want to to sleep in a room, in a proper room. If you have a camper van or you have to, to go to a, a, another campsite which will be uh, outside of this site. And uh, there are many restaurants and you can, of course, have dinner and uh, at the sports center there, there is a, a restaurant the picture on the left uh, shows the the terrace of the restaurant which is which is overlooking the the lake uh, over the river so it's it's very uh, very nice uh, setting for for the headquarters of the of the event after the the actual racing uh, we will uh, organize a week of uh, cycle touring in the, in the area so there are a lot of things to see, uh, some museum, uh, the food is very good, of course, uh, the wine is good as well. So there is plenty of, of things to offer uh, for tourists and uh, on bicycle or without bicycle. All right, Mark, uh, fascinating and exciting. And I'm sure there are a lot of people who will want to find out more and hopefully come to see it or come to participate in the world championships in France uh, this year in July. Now, uh, do you have any uh, final thoughts you want to leave our audience with? Yes, indeed. Um, I would like uh, the organizers would like to see more uh, women and junior participating to the races as well, because it, I think it's a nice opportunity to, to race in a friendly atmosphere. Uh, uh, everything is uh, open to anybody, so we'd like to see more of, of you coming to the event as well. Um, tell me how people can find out more information about this. So we have uh, our website, which is uh, operational, and you can find all the information uh, I was talking about uh, earlier uh, on this website, as well as the registration uh, link to to participate to the event. And if people have uh, questions uh, about uh, the event itself, uh, who should they contact? They can use the contact email, which is uh, on the site as well. And uh, I try to respond as fast as I can. Uh, <laughs> you can ask a question in German, in English, Italian, uh, Italiano, Spanish even. I try to respond. Well, you sound like the perfect person to be <laughs> uh, pulling this off, Mark. So, And it's been uh, great working with you on this. So thank you very much. Uh, we look forward to, uh, to a successful uh, world championship in France this year. We'll keep, be keeping our eyes on it. And I think maybe even do some updates. Maybe we'll chat again uh, soon about mm -hmm. how it's going. And uh, certainly after, uh, we will find out from you how it all went. So, uh, Mark, thank you so much for being with us today. Perfect. It was a pleasure. <laughs> and see you soon in Orgelet. And there is my pal, mon ami. Uh, Mark, are you, are you there? Hey, bonjour, Gary. Hello. 
Hello, Bonjour. everyone. Bonjour. <laughs> so uh, great. That was a, a really interesting introduction to what will be going on in, in July. Um, one of the things you mentioned to me after we finished recording that segment uh, that you thought maybe we needed to talk about uh, that was going to be at the uh, at the World Championships is the uh, Bike Expo, the recumbent Bike Expo. So tell us about that if you can. Yeah, true. Um, we will organize a bike exhibition uh, on site in Orgelet. Um We welcome... Uh, manufacturers well, i think ice has already uh, said that they will come um and we will have uh, dealers french uh, dealers uh, showing velomobiles uh, trikes and uh, e-assist uh, vehicles and we also would like to welcome uh, home builders because i think it's a very uh, significant and interesting part of the uh, recumbent world uh, all those guys uh, having clever ideas and and building uh, very nice bikes 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 so um if you are uh, home builders uh, uh, a home builder and you want to to come and and show you your creativity creativity uh, please contact us and uh, you you will have a, a, some space to to present your bicycle you know that's a great idea in any uh, at any time to have a bike expo like that, but especially this year, because when you think of uh, those home builders uh, showing off what they have, you think of Spetsy, don't you, uh, uh, every year? And of course, this year Spetsy has been canceled once again, and so it will be a great opportunity for those who may have thought about going to Spetsy to uh, to show off their their you know, home-built uh, bikes and trikes and uh, velomobiles, whatever, uh, to be able to go to France and show them off at, in that venue. So I think that's a great idea. That's right. Although I would say that, uh, of course, we, we don't uh, have the, the same capacity of, of the, as, as the Spetsy to, to, so, to show as many bicycles, but uh, we will do uh, our best to, to, to accommodate uh, everyone. And of just... Just a, a special uh, thought about uh, all, uh, all our friends in Ukraine and Russia, because uh, I know that there is a, a number of, uh, of uh, bike builders there which have uh, very nice uh, ideas. And I think it's a pity that uh, the situation uh, is as bad now. Uh, let's hope that uh, it will improve by rapidly. And um, maybe we can, we can see some of you uh, from the East coming to, the, to France. That would Hopefully. be wonderful. I yeah. would like to echo those sentiments as well. We we heard from uh, about Alexei in, in Ukraine at the beginning when Hans yeah. Zagala yeah. talked to us about his builds and and such. So absolutely, that would be that would be a great thing. Any um, anything to bring us up to date since we've uh, had our recording or any last thoughts you have to share with the audience? Yeah, we have about uh, 20, 25 uh, registered uh, participants. Uh, today, uh, so uh, keep uh, keep them coming, uh, keep uh, <laughs> keep uh, registering, and hopefully we will be a, a very large uh, number to make it uh, really fun. That sounds great. Now yeah. um, we, of course, uh, will uh, list put the link to the World Championship registration and and their website, as uh, Mark had uh, talked about earlier in the link in the uh, description below. So you guys will be able to click on that and go right mm -hmm. to it. Uh, these events have been amazing in the past. I attended the one that was in uh, Great Britain uh, a couple of years ago. Great fun, a great competition, lots of friendly folks, lots of interesting um, re HPVs there. So we look forward to what you have going on and we're going to follow it. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to be able to make it in person this year, but one way or the other, we're going to keep track. We will get back in touch with you, Mark, uh, later in the year, maybe right before the event and see how it's mm -hmm. going. And then maybe we'll have you back on um, late summer or something and you can wrap it up and tell us how it all went. And uh, maybe we'll get some, uh, uh, some insight into what went on this year. Of course, uh, that will be my pleasure to to come back to your show. Very and good. Let's hope that you can make it to France in this summer. <laughs> yeah, it would be great. It sure would be great. So, okay. all right, uh, Mark, thank you so much Thanks for so sharing all the information. Merci beaucoup and uh, au revoir. À bientôt. Au revoir. <laughs> bye bye. Okay. Cheers.
Thanks. All right, guys. Let's uh, move along to the sports report with Denny. He's got the sports report and actually a little bonus here about the uh, big honk and trike rally as well. I think you'll enjoy this. Larry? Hello, sports fans. I have a few events to cover this month. The first event of the year was the Pace Bend Ultra held in Spicewood, Texas, the weekend of February 5th and 6th. The hilly 6.2-mile loop features smooth asphalt and stunning views of Lake Travis. John Crawford was the only recumbent entry, and he did 111.6 miles in a 24-hour race. Next is the Sebring 112 and 24-hour race. This perennial race returned from last year's hiatus the weekend of February 19th and 20th. There was a pretty high percentage of bents entered this year as 27 out of 140 total entries were recumbents and HPVs. Several records were set. John Schlitter broke the 12-hour recumbent 65 to 69 age record with 284.2 miles. Cliff Federspiel set a new overall recumbent 12-hour record. Cliff finished the last lap with the same distance as John, but he finished his last lap seven minutes ahead of John and was given a final distance of 285.5 miles. The best distance in the 12-hour race was Dave Lewis, who did an incredible 344 miles in his Velomobile. Dave has just recently returned to racing in the Velomobile after his big year in 2018, where he set the 24-hour record of 647 miles in the 24, and later that year placed fourth in the self-supported Trans Am race in 17 days and 20 hours. I caught up with Dave briefly after the race, and he started training eh, around the holidays. More on Dave and John Schlitter in the next segment. So with a decently large field at Sebring this year, in near perfect weather, there were some great rides. Maria Parker set a record in her age group in the 12 hour with 258.3 miles, breaking her old record and was overall high miles in the 12 hour women's division. In other recumbent results, Jim Parker of Cruise Bike was the first recumbent in the 103 mile race, setting a course record of four hours, five minutes and 41 seconds, seven seconds behind the overall winner on a standard bike. A very tight and exciting finish. Ron Thompson of Maryland was eighth overall with a four hour, 36 minute 100. And we interviewed Ron last July on the show and he talked about his front wheel drive, long wheel base bike he calls the G4. His wife Peggy also rode one of his bike builds to a five hour, 30 minute century. Good for second overall in her age group. Dana Thompson, who is definitely not a female, there was an errant listing in the results, did a 530 in his Velomobile. Rodney Owen rounded out the recumbent 100 miler entries. More results in the 12 hour race. David Leila Jenny was ninth overall in the 55 to 59 age group, followed by Ken Holthausen in 12th. In the male 60 to 64 age group, Dobie Busey, Doug Klein, and Dominic Brownlow were second, third, and fourth, and Larry Oslin was seventh. In the male 65 to 69, John Schlitter was first overall, while Kent Polk, Larry Mutchler, and Rick Moore were second, fifth, and sixth, respectively, followed by Jim Reeves in eighth. In the 70 to 74 age group, Reuben Randall was second overall, followed by Dave Towns and Dan Fallon. In the male 80-plus division, Ron Milburn was number one at 83 years old. He turned in 110 miles. Really nice. In the drafting 24-hour race, Michael Griffin was the only 24-hour recumbent entry riding 206 miles in the 70 to 79 age group. In the non-drafting Ram qualifier, Graham Scarden was the first rider in his age group, and Steve Morton and Christopher Zimmerman were fifth and ninth in their age groups. There was a long list, so I hope I didn't miss anyone. Congratulations to all that competed. It was great seeing you all there. Just six days after the race at Sebring, John Schlitter and Dave Lewis both were entered in a 500-mile open road race from Jacksonville, Florida to the tip of Key West, known as the Florida 500. Both were self-supported and both finished. John Schlitter finished the race in 24 hours, 28 minutes, 
Dave Lewis and his Velo finished the 500-mile open road course in an incredible 18 hours and 58 minutes and was first overall. John finished fourth overall about 30 minutes behind third place. It looks like Schlitter and Lewis are back. Finally, I'd like to give a shout out to the big honkin' trike rally held here in Inverness this past week. While not a race, it's a lovely gathering of recumbent trikes and bikes. It's a week of rides and trails local to the area. It's loosely organized by Gary Bradford, Dan Hansen, and Dana Thompson, whose initials BHT were the inspiration for the name Big Honkin' Trike Rally. I chatted with Gary on the phone and he said, this was the third year for the gathering. It's not really an event, but more of an open invitation with a location and dates. The rally has grown from about 35 in 2019 to more than 100 this year. 109 were officially welcomed on the Sunday ride and reception. Gary said that during the week, a few more drifted in and out, and he estimated there were about 125 participants in total. The original goal was to meet new people, and they've done that in spades. There were riders from as far away as California and Canada. Many were back again after last year's cancellation. I attended a reception on Sunday, and it was fun and food. Gary wanted to give a shout-out to Ken Poindexter, who could not make it this year. Ken had been instrumental in spreading the word in previous years, and he was missed at this year's gathering. Gary said they will likely do another next year, but they may be seeking a sponsor to partner with. So that's all I have for this month. Until next time, stay on the bike and keep moving forward. Back to you, Gary. Yeah, all right. Thanks, Danny. A couple of things here, Dan. Um, Kenny Poindexter, uh, we want to send our best wishes to him. Uh, he's having some very serious health problems, as many people know. And uh, nice gesture there from the honk and tri yeah. rally. Yeah? They, they wanted to make sure that uh, I mentioned him. So yeah. um, he's uh, he's working hard on, on getting better. Yep. All our best uh, to you, Ken. And uh, John Lloyd, uh, just want to shout out and thanks for that uh, nice little video of the Big yep. Honk and Trike Rally. And uh, that that uh, worked out very nicely. It looks like everybody had a great time. Um, and the last thing, just finishing up, uh, Denny, I, I got a few people reminding me uh, as we get to the sports that the pedal preseason has started now in, or is about to start, I think, in Australia again. A yeah. Great racing going on down there. Uh, we've had shows on it in the past. So, yeah, I tend to forget that. It. And I see you mentioned it. And I said, ah, yeah, there's another well, thing we could be. We'll probably about. report. Uh, we'll probably report on that. Yeah, it's now, gonna the going to be there fall down there and, and uh, school's back in session and should be a lot of fun. Right, right. So I, I'm going to take your sports report and segue into our last segment here. Uh, folks, we um, we saw there uh, John, uh, Dave Lewis, I should say, uh, that Denny talked about with the Velomobile and uh, Bike Sebring and then the Florida 500. And uh, I hope you saw the video of him flying by uh, there at Bike Sebring. Uh, so with that, I, I found yesterday online this interesting uh, article uh, in what they call Odd News. This is even odder than you can imagine. Let me read this to you, folks. Uh, Trey, you ready to go? Let's do it. All right. So here's the headline. Unusual submarine-shaped vehicle spotted on Florida Road. March 3rd, an unusual submarine-shaped vehicle that captured the attention of drivers on, on a Florida road was identified as an enclosed recumbent bicycle. Michael Rood captured video when he spotted the bright yellow vehicle, which he compared to a spaceship on US-41 in Punta Gorda. Rood said the vehicle was very low to the ground. If there was somebody in there, they had to be lying back, he told WBBH-TV. Michael Holm, owner of Fort Myers Cyclery, said, The vehicle appears to be a recumbent bicycle, a bike in which the rider leans backward with an expensive cover. I would expect it to be in excess of $20,000, Holm said. Rude said the bike had a blinking red light, but it became difficult to see once it was next to his car. 
This is like begging to get hit or run over, he said. Florida Highway Patrol Trooper Ken Watson said bicycles are allowed on US-41, but he would have stopped the rider to discuss the visibility issue. You're putting yourself in a very dangerous situation, Watson said. With that bike being so small and so low to the ground, it can be very difficult to see. He said the rider could also have been cited for holding up traffic. They have every right to be there, but we want them to be safely there, Watson said. All right, enough of that nonsense. We, um, I, I posted on Dave Lewis's uh, Facebook uh, wall uh, the, the uh, link to this thing, and Dave actually responded uh, today. Let me tell you what he said. I was heading back from the Florida 500, left Summerland Key that morning. I think that day it was 321 miles. 41 was empty except for just a few cars. That's why I took the lane. Lots of debris in the bike lane. Oh, well, to all the haters. I know I'm super visible and super conscious of traffic around me and very careful. I may contact the news channel to see if they want to do an interview. I wish the world was more enlightened or at least more positive. And uh, Dave did post uh, in a comment uh, subsequent to that, that he is going to contact the channel. So, uh, I, you know, you can guess my thoughts on this, but let's get uh, a couple of folks who actually do ride uh, all the time in their velomobiles on the road and see if they feel like uh, they cannot be seen. So if we can get Nina and Joseph up here, we can start with them. And then any of the other panelists, if you're interested, just shoot me a private chat here and we'll get you up too. So uh, Nina, can we start with you? Uh, you, I, I mentioned that you just sent Frosty, your Velomobile off for some work, but uh, you ride that on the roads there in Illinois all the time. Uh, any thoughts on this article? Well, they. I, I watched the video clip from the news station and they seemed very arrogant. Uh, the people that needed to be educated was them. They can clearly see it. I get stopped in my velomobile all the time for people that say, I can't see you. Like, I see you and I can't see you. So the problem isn't that they can't see. The problem is a, a mental processing issue, which is part of vision. Uh, a lot of vision is actually not the actual vision, but the mental processing. So they have a mental processing issue. They have a mental problem. And perhaps with education, they could get better. I think so. Here's a guy who knows how to educate people about vellum wheels. Joseph, uh, tell us about your riding. You've ridden all over the world. You commonly ride, of course, all the time in, in Germany there. What's, uh, what's the situation there as far as being seen and drivers saying they can't see you? Well, Gary, you know, out on the road, I have yet to experience somebody obviously not seeing me. Um, I think the main issue uh, with uh, being seen is uh, in urban traffic. You know, is when you can hide behind cars. When the car behind the car that's behind you um, may not anticipate you. Uh, so as a velomobile rider, uh, you make it a habit um, to know what's going on behind you. You, you have to, uh, most at least, have two rear view mirrors. And I would encourage everyone uh, to have two of them because some t there are times when one is not enough. And, and you do like you would uh, as a responsible car driver. You know, you constantly scan what's going on. And so when cars come up behind me, I usually uh, uh, see very early on if the driver has seen me uh, because then that driver would already start begin to move over a little bit. And then you know they have seen you. And it hasn't happened yet to me, uh, but I have uh, people reported that, uh, that sometimes actually people are so distracted they don't, they don't see you. But then that is not an issue of size. That's not an issue of whether you have a flag or not. If somebody's not looking, uh, that doesn't matter. You know? Otherwise, uh, it wouldn't be so many standard cyclists that get hit in traffic, but it would only be those trikers and velomobile riders that are low to the ground. You know, so in urban traffic, I, I uh, urge everyone uh, to put yourself into the shoes of a driver and don't do anything crazy because you don't want to get harmed. But on an open road, don't be scared. 
And when in conversation, people talk to me, oh, I've seen that. I've seen you in this. Uh, you're dangerously low. Then I say, if you can't see that, you should not be driving. You know, and then people look at me and I say, yes, I'm serious about that. If you cannot see an object of that size in front of you on the road, you don't belong there. Well, like the guy in the article was saying how he you know, obviously saw the Velmobile yeah. and yes. was fascinated by it. But yeah, that's Nina's point, you know? He couldn't, right. He, but he couldn't see him when he went by them through the side. Like, what does that have to do with it? He clearly saw him ahead of time. He needs to go over. And right. if, he can't see him when he's behind him either, right? I mean, what's the point of that? So, it's, well, you it's know, kind of I, I probably Nina would say that, say the same. Uh, but let me say that. Uh, I think uh, uh, we're in a we're in a sort of a, a a weird world, you know, where we believe we need more and more massive cars, bigger than before, wider than before, higher than before, to be safe. You know, and we're getting less safe at the same time. We are uh, clearly getting the more less we seek to protect or shield ourselves from our environment. I think the less safe we actually are. Yeah, the numbers here in this country, I'm not sure what it's like in Europe, the last year or two have been phenomenally high as far as pedestrians and bikers uh, being hit and, and hurt very seriously or and killed. Sometimes, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I don't want to sound uh, to be discriminatory, but you know, sometimes uh, you have people behind the wheel that are simply too short for the type of cars uh, that they have been uh, sitting into, you know? and yeah, they can I mean, barely look over the hood. They, we, we so. need the height restrictions that you see at amusement parks. Is that where you're going with that? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say that if if I got one thing from that video, it's that the car wasn't safe. Like that car and that driver were not safe. Right. Oh. Exactly. All right. We don't need to belabor this. I think it's pretty obvious to our viewers uh, the nonsense uh, that was espoused in, in that article and video. But I want to also, uh, uh, Joseph, if I could, uh, talk to you for just a minute about next month's Layback Back Report, where we are going to have our annual Velomobile update. Yeah. And you have already helped out. I haven't had a chance to work on it yet. But uh, if you could give us a, a little teaser uh, about uh, where you went and what the video is about that we're going to show in your segment. Well, you know, I, I had to service my own Velomobile, so I went to Drunton. And in Drunton, uh, you know, Drunton is sort of the epicenter of the Velomobile production, even though the factory is in Romania. Uh, I think the biggest deals are made in Drunton, where Intercity Bike and Velomobile.nl are located. And I, I had a very nice, very interesting and very informing interview uh, with the Velomobile.nl guys uh, on uh, their production, how they do it, uh, what's the thinking behind it, what motivates them. Uh, and actually a lot of detail uh, on the uh, Snook L, which is the larger version um, of the uh, Snook, which is one of the probably fastest uh, serial production models uh, out in the market. And our April topic is uh, supposed to, to highlight a, a bit how the market has developed uh, and how many new models are out there. And, and we will speculate a little bit about what it does to the market, what it, what it offers to uh, consumers, and maybe also what uh, potential risks are to the manufacturers. Because you know, after all, we're a niche within a niche uh, uh, with uh, Velomobiles. Absolutely great. Yeah, I'm excited to uh, to edit the video that you sent me. We're going to have a lot more involved uh, with Velomobiles. We're going to have Doug with us, I'm pretty sure. And we're going to widen the scope of the update uh, on Velomobiles uh, next month. Uh, so thank you, Joseph, already for what you've done there. We look forward to talking to you next month and, uh, and Nina, you as well in our Velomobile update. And thanks for commenting here on this silliness as well. Pleasure. So, all right, guys, we will see you soon. Uh, we're going to finish up here now by uh, talking about the amazing sponsors that make the laid back bike report possible, starting with TerraCycle. From fairings to headrests, whatever accessory you need, Pat and crew have you covered. And trailside trikes. If you find yourself in Florida, near the Withlacoochee Trail, or in Knoxville, Tennessee, check out Andrew's shop and amazing crew. And Terra Trike and Green Speed Trikes. 
Your vision, whatever it is, TerraTrike has a trike to take you there. And green speed cutting edge designs create performance through Aussie ingenuity and laid back cycles. The top USA dealer for TerraTrike and the premier source for Cat Trike, Ice, and Green Speed. We give you the freedom to ride. And Connecticut Yankee Peddler. We feature multiple brands of trikes, including electric assist models and test rides at our Southern Iowa uh, facility. Our hospitality and in Southern Iowa is always available at our mega store in Cheriton. And Avenue Trikes, with the gearing you need and the comfort you want, in stock and ready to ship so you can enjoy riding again. Dealer inquiries are welcome. And Azub, Victor Zico is one of many Azub ambassadors. His story of the winter expedition to Nordcap can be found on the Azub Recumbents Facebook page, as well as the stories of many other travelers. And Recumbent PDX. Cat Trikes West Coast Megastore. Schedule your test ride on trikes with Pedal Assist Electric from both Bosch and Bafang, Roloff and Schlump component groups, and adaptive builds. Experience the joy of Cat Trike. All right, guys. Uh, I wanted to remind you that we have our... Um, our laid back bike report uh, viewer uh, submissions that uh, we love to show. So if you've got pictures of your accomplishments or your events, just uh, ship them to us at laidbackbikereport at gmail.com. All right, our next laid back bike report, we've already talked about it. It's April 3rd though, at 2 p.m. as usual, and it will be our Velomobile 2022 update. So you won't want to miss that. How can you support the Laid Back Bot Report? Well, please like us on Facebook and you could subscribe to us on YouTube and you could learn more about us by clicking that little white eye up there and head to the laidbackbikereport.com website. Uh, you can find out lots more about us. You could buy one of our hats there. They're a great buy and lots of fun to wear and they're pretty green. Uh, yeah, so do that, and uh, you can also find more information about our Patreon supporters, all of which you see right there. And uh, you can uh, go to patreon.com as well and just look up Laidback Bike Report. Uh, so that's a monthly uh, that's a monthly obligation, uh, and you can do so for as little as a dollar a month. It really helps us out. So thanks to all our Patreons. All right, guys, let's uh, bring our crew and whoever. <laughs> Our guests that remain back up here for our final thank yous. Thanks, guys. That was a really interesting show. Um, you guys uh, really helped out, with, as always, making it uh, pretty seamless. So we hope our viewers appreciate these amazing crew members. Guys, thanks a lot. All right. So thanks to the crew members. Uh, but most of all, thanks to all of you, our viewers, who watch us every month. So until next month. From all of us here at the Laid Back Bike Report, so long, Bent Riders. So long. So long. Bye-bye. So